One day, there was a big fight between the different parts of the body over which part was the most important. The brain said, I do all the thinking, so it would be impossible for the body to function without me. The eye said, I see everything, and so without me, we'd be lost. The stomach said, I digest everything we eat. Without me, we'd starve. And the leg said, without me, we wouldn't be able to move anywhere. The body would be useless. But amidst all this fighting, the rectum simply shut up. And then a few days later, the brain got all cloudy, the eyes started to water, the stomach got extremely bloated, and the legs could barely stand. And so just like that, they all conceded that the little rectum was the most important part. The moral of the story? It pays to be an asshole, which is exactly what this Autobot is. Okay, okay, maybe calling the Autobot Ironhide an asshole is a bit too harsh. But ever since the start, I was never a big fan of this guy. For some reason, Ironhide just rubbed me the wrong way. From the moment I saw him in the original Transformers cartoon, I immediately pegged him as my least favorite Autobot. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here, so let's rewind a little bit. The first time I ever saw Ironhide, or to be more accurate, the toy that would eventually be brought over to the US and turned into the character Ironhide was in the Japanese toy line Diaclone. Even back then, as a little kid, I could tell that this guy kinda sucked. I mean, while the rest of the car robos in the line weren't all pictures of perfection, case in point, the toys that would eventually become Sunstreaker and Wheeljack were so proportionally off they looked like apes. But Ironhide didn't even look like an actual humanoid robot. His little legs were obscured by the battle platform that he stood on, and he didn't even have a head. And if that wasn't bad enough, his alt mode, compared to all the other slick and stylish sports cars, was a van. So yeah, not a great first impression. The reason for this obvious difference though was simple. Unlike the Transformers who were all sentient beings, in the Diaclone line, these guys were meant to be mechs, piloted by humans. And so it made more sense viewing the initial Ironhide toy as more of a battle station, as located behind the van's windshield, which formed the chest of the robot, you could see what was obviously a seat for a soldier to sit on and pilot said robot. Fortunately, when Diaclone was brought over and turned into the Transformers, this mech design for Ironhide was redesigned for the cartoon. Humorously though, since the comic was released well before the cartoon, all those artists had to work with were the original toys, so at least for the first few issues, Ironhide still lacked a head. Anyway, like I said, for the cartoon, Ironhide was thankfully redesigned into a more humanoid-looking robot with an actual head. Unfortunately, his new design was one of the blandest and generic looking ones in my opinion. Yes, he had a mohawk, which was admittedly cool, as well as an interesting array of weaponry that sprouted from his hands and his back, like the Autobot version of an Inspector Gadget. But all that red and rather blocky midsection didn't add up to a very visually exciting robot. And then there was his personality. So Ironhide was depicted as the gruff and rather stubborn veteran of the team, which I find funny as I envision writer Bob Budiansky holding up the headless Ironhide toy and thinking to himself, Yep, now this looks like a very headstrong character to me. In fact, Ironhide actually got his name from a late 1960s TV detective show called Ironside, whose titular protagonist was also a grizzled veteran of his profession. Now while I'm not that old to have ever seen this show, for me the name Ironside does bring to mind another popular 80s television actor, Michael Ironside. And I'm sure that anyone who is familiar with this guy will agree that he was one hell of a tough, no-nonsense SOB and would have made an excellent peg for the Ironhide character. But I've headed off course a bit. Ironhide was one of Prime's oldest and most trusted friends, which seemed appropriate since they were both predominantly red and shared the same voice actor, the legendary Peter Cullen. But unlike Prime, who sounded like an honorable, gentle, calm but firm, well-rounded leader and father figure, Ironhide was like an old blowhard and drunk uncle with his deep drawn out drawl and the way he kept calling Prime Pram that to a little Asian kid sounded odd and uncool compared to say Scatman Crothers Jazz. But being old or sounding drunk wasn't my real problem with Ironhide. My problem was that he was kind of depicted as an impulsive individual who oftentimes got himself into situations in over his head. Something quite uncharacteristic for an old guy who should in my book be smarter, no, wiser in his advanced age. 
But here's the thing. I don't really believe that making Ironhide into an unlikable character was the intention of the writers. While his character didn't appeal to me as a kid, as an older fan, I have come to, dare I say, appreciate Ironhide's more positive qualities. His primary role was that of security, and he wasn't just Prime's oldest friend, he was also his personal bodyguard, a role he took very seriously. His greatest strength was his loyalty to Prime and the Autobot cause, almost to a fault in that it drove him at times to act without properly assessing his situation. Case in point, he is often the Autobot who is quick to accuse fellow Autobots he suspects as traitors, even without clear and proper evidence, and usually resorts to beating said suspects down. So yeah, asshole. But again, while not being an excuse, I guess you could see how his extreme reliance on pure heart and emotion can get the better of him. On the brighter side though, that same emotion and loyalty will lead him to sacrifice his very own body and well-being if it means protecting comrades that he holds dear to him. Especially Prime, whom he has literally taken a bullet for on a number of occasions. And this immense appreciation of his selflessness has been reflected back at him by fellow teammates, at least the ones he doesn't accuse of being traitors. And Ironhide is highly regarded within the Autobot ranks as a highly dependable and competent warrior. I mean, if I were an Autobot on a mission, I know I'd want Ironhide to be on my side, at the very least, to act as my shield. That being said, a better sense of appreciation or not, I wasn't that torn over seeing his body graphically riddled with blaster holes in the 1986 animated movie. And while the writers did give him a last hurrah with him heroically but pointlessly struggling to hold on to Megatron's leg, I myself didn't really shed a tear when the Decepticon leader then proceeded to make Ironhide more accurate to his original toy by blowing off his head. Okay, okay, that was uncalled for, and I apologize to all the fans of Ironhide out there. All two of you. Just kidding! But seriously, let's iron out all our differences so I won't have to hide my enthusiasm when I ask you to give me a like and subscribe to my channel. As you know, every little thing you do will help me out immensely. And for my regular viewers, thank you. Now back to the story. Like I said, throwing aside whatever negative feelings I have for the Ironhide character, I think we can all agree that Ironhide is one of the most popular Autobots ever made. Which is why there wasn't much of a surprise that he was included as one of the very few Autobots in the first live-action Transformers movie. Okay, I guess to be more accurate, a character that looked to be heavily inspired by the original G1 Ironhide was featured in the movie. And just like the original Ironhide, this one was also a seasoned warrior and a very close companion to Prime. But unlike the original Ironhide though, this new version was cooler. Gone was the bland red van, and in its place, new Ironhide transformed into a formidable GMC top kick truck colored black, which while I'm pretty sure wasn't really intentional, served as a nice callback to the original Diaclone toy, which was also released in black. And then there was his robot mode. Oh, his robot mode. No longer was he a bland, generic-looking Autobot, he was now a huge, wide, and imposing warrior who sported a mean-looking bullish mug. And no longer satisfied with just being a security expert, this new Ironhide was the Autobot weapons specialist, which was reflected in the two huge cannons he wielded on each arm. I remember this Ironhide being my favorite design, Autobot or Decepticon, from the movie, and his initial Voyager toy was extremely sought after. And that was the first of many, many, many movie Ironhide toys through the years. I eventually settled on the Recon Ironhide release in 2009, which was a greatly retooled version of the initial release with a non-movie accurate lightning pattern and a shit ton of weaponry from multiple rifles and knives packed in. Of course, being the completionist that I am, I also got myself a nice movie masterpiece version which I topped off with an upgrade kit from DNA Designs, and I called it good. Anyway, while as a whole not many Autobots and Decepticons got any real character development and personalities in the movies, I don't think Ironhide did pretty bad for himself. No longer the brash and stubborn character, this Ironhide struck me as more reserved and calculating, a deadlier and more competent warrior if you will. The writers even managed to sneak in a nice callback to the original Ironhide when while sneaking around their human ally Sam Witwicky's backyard, Ironhide's toe? is targeted by Sam's Chihuahua Mojo as the perfect spot to relieve himself. 
to which Ironhide accuses him of leaking lubricants all over his foot, which was one of G1 Ironhide's most common catchphrases. The leaking lubricants part, that is, not the pee on the foot. He then goes on to complain to himself that that's gonna rust, a rather flippant remark at the time, but one which would later on prove to be quite on point when in the third movie, he unfortunately met his end at the hands of the 13-year-old spoiler, traitorous Sentinel Prime. In an ironic twist that sends Ironhide fans headed for a heartbreak, while acting as bodyguard and protector to the ancient Autobot, he is double-crossed and shot from behind by Sentinel Prime, who reveals his true allegiance to the Decepticons. And while it's not the blast itself that kills poor Ironhide, he succumbs quickly to an extreme case of cosmic rust inflicted on him by the blast. So basically, finishing off what Mojo started two movies prior. Bad dog. Despite the rather inglorious death, a three-movie Bayverse run for an Autobot not named Prime or B is quite the accomplishment. And it did wonders to the original Ironhide character as well in terms of a significant revival into the mythos. While not part of the main cast, Ironhide was a reoccurring character in the 2007 series Transformers Animated. And the writers gave him the cool, unique ability to change his robot skin into a tough silver alloy. Kind of like the X-Man Colossus literally giving him an iron hide. On an interesting note, before the series was abruptly cancelled, it was revealed by the writers that in line with the intention to morph the Autobot team into a mirror of the live-action movie cast, they planned to move Ironhide and another reoccurring character, Jazz, into the main team with a modified design closer to what he looked like in the movies, in that he also sported huge twin cannons on his arms. But it was not meant to be. And while Ironhide was also not present in the following series, Transformers Prime, an Ironhide toy that was most likely inspired by the unused animated design did see the light of day in retail shelves. And while it was more of an extended concept character to further beef up the line, it was a pretty decent toy, which is more than I can say for a lot of the modern takes of G1 Ironhide that came out around the same time or after. See. Prior to the movies, the bulk of Ironhide toys released in the market were basically a bunch of non-related Transformer toys simply using the name Ironhide in order for Hasbro to retain the trademark, or reissues of the original G1 toy. Speaking of which, we got this lovely reissue in 2007. In case it's not obvious, that's the original G1 toy sporting a cardboard cutout of the cartoon head for more accuracy. It was a half-assed attempt but at least they tried. It's worth noting though that an obscure and now most likely defunct third-party company, Gear for Toys, took the car's idea and did one better with an actual upgrade kit that gave the vintage toy not only an actual head, but shoulders and arms as well. Noise! Anyway, after a slew of reissues and trademark holding toys, we finally got our first modern update of a G1 Ironhide on retail as part of the 2008 Universe line. And he was... meh. After getting over the initial excitement of seeing an actual modern Ironhide, reality quickly set in and what was left was a really poorly designed toy, which unfortunately will be a reoccurring theme when it comes to even more updated Ironhide toys. But we'll get to that later. So back to Universe. First of all, the alt mode, while being an arguably nicer looking SUV-ish vehicle, featured mismatched clear and painted windows, the latter one riddled with numerous transformation brake lines which made everything look so messy. And then the robot mode was short and stocky and inexplicably sported a bluish gray face which itself wasn't bad, just odd. The next Ironhide, while sort of better, would be nothing but a retooled repaint of a previously released character for the Combiner Wars toy line in 2015. So yeah, not really Ironhide in my book. That same year though, Takara got all three Ironhide fans excited with the announcement of an official masterpiece version of Ironhide. Meant to be the ultimate representation of the G1 character, it unfortunately didn't pan out quite as well as many, including myself, had hoped for. From the start, when Takara excitedly showed off the very first preview pics, you could tell that there was something off, specifically with the proportions of the robot mode and the design choice to have the van's front wheels end up on his behind in robot mode was just weird. Which brings me to a major source of frustration with Ironhide toys in general. Seriously, 
The guy transforms into a van, which is essentially a box. A rectangular box, but a box nonetheless. I mean, there is a whole toy line of cool-looking mech animals and creatures that all literally transform into perfect cubes. So why is it so difficult to come up with a decent-looking, proportionally correct robot for Ironhide? For the most part, most of the Ironhide toys are overthought and over-engineered messes in my opinion. Even the later retail versions from the Siege and Earthrise lines released in 2019 and 2020 have their problems. Okay, sorry, I take that back. Siege Ironhide is a great toy, but it's a Cybertron version of Ironhide, so it doesn't count. The Earthrise version, which is an extensive retool of Siege, is the bigger offender. I mean, maybe you could pass off the detachable roof as a callback to the original toy. In fact, third-party company Nonef Productions made and sold a kit to convert the roof into a battle platform similar to the original toy, but Hasbro didn't even bother to re-sculpt the feet of the Siege toy to give him a more cohesive Van Alt mode. Like I said, frustrating. Fortunately though, things do seem to be looking up for Ironhide on the toy front. After spending an extra buck for multiple upgrade kits from Nonef to fix up my Earthrise Ironhide, Hasbro almost immediately Fs me over by releasing an all-new Studio Series 86 Ironhide. And while it's far from perfect, it's a huge improvement over all the other previous Ironhides, so I'll take it. And on the Masterpiece front, two hopefully improved options are on the way from eternal third-party rivals x Transbots and Fans Toys. And unlike the official Takara version, at least based on the released prototype shots, both these new options look very promising. Now I hope this episode hasn't upset all four Ironhide fans out there. I know, I may have seemed harsh starting this all out by calling him an <laughs> asshole, but really, if you think about it, even if he is one, he's one <laughs> asshole that the rest of the Autobots definitely cannot do without. But if you want to talk about a real asshole in the Autobot ranks, you can check out this guy over here. Or there are other non-transformer options over here. Either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more.